Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today is Friday, November 18th, and we are very happy and excited to have the legendary Martin Armstrong. Martin is the owner of Armstrong Economics and former chairman of Princeton Economics International. He's best known for his economic predictions based on the economic confidence model, which he developed. His website, Armstrong Economics, offers a unique perspective intended to educate the general public and organizations on the global economic and political environment's underlying trends. Uh, the mission is to research historical cyclical patterns and market behavior in timing, price, and crisis to understand better and identify potential future trends using an extensive monetary database and advanced proprietary models. Welcome, Martin. Well, thank you for inviting me. Great. I thought we'd begin with the discussion on your model, the economic confidence model. Uh, if you could elaborate what it is, how it works, and uh, what, what it is you know, currently indicating on the economy, the financial markets, and geopolitical risks. Well, I had actually uh, discovered a list of panics. It was published in the Wall Street Journal back in 1907 when I was doing research. And it covered a period of uh, 224 years. And there are 26 panics. And so I just, you know, divided the number and it came up with this 8.6. And I thought it was just an average, uh, honestly. Um, and then I tested it back in history going forward. I mean, it's been incredible. Uh, I mean, even Paul Volcker came out and said that there's about an eight year business, you know, business cycle. And, and that's effectively what it is. So it's, it's not based upon even just the United States. I mean, because the list was international, uh, it picked up effectively everything uh, from war. I mean, um, and uh, over the years, I mean, I've learned how uh, accurate it has been. I mean, it's been quite surprising, actually. Uh, and, and my clients have taught me really how the world functions. Um, well, back in the 80s, we had a, a client, Universal Bank of Lebanon, and they had found in a, a ledger in their basement where somebody had written down the Lebanese pound every day. And they asked me if we could create a model on that. I said, sure. You know, and they sent it over and we plugged it in and it correlated it with the rest of the world. And I thought there was something wrong. I called them. I said, there's got to be something wrong with this data. It says your country is going to you know, fall apart in eight days. And very calmly, uh, they said, well, gee, what currency would you recommend? And I thought that was a very strange <laughs> response. I said the Swiss franc. And, and eight days later, the Lebanese civil war began. Uh, the same thing happened when we had a, a client in uh, Saudi Arabia who was big in shipping. And he called and he says, what do you think gold's going to do tomorrow? Iran's going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf. I see you saying a war is going to start tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think gold's going to do? Mm -hmm. um, so over the years, I found that obviously people know in advance. Uh, like, you know, when they saw the terrorist attacks and things of that nature, uh, the SEC kind of looked at our stuff and basically began to investigate who bought you know, options a day, you know, one or two days before 9-11, stuff like that. Uh, so, I mean, if you know you're going to start a war or create some sort of event, they, they typically will buy or do something in advance. Uh, so, I mean, even right now, with all the rising tension uh, between Russia and, and China, China's selling off all its U.S. debt. Um, you know, if you're going to go to war, you certainly don't want to have assets in that country. And this is part of the whole problem that the Biden administration and NATO have created. I mean, it's just, it seems as though they just want war. And all this rhetoric uh, that they keep putting out <clears throat> is very detrimental to the world economy. Um, 
what they did to Russia was really appalling uh, in that back in 2014, when Russia went into Crimea, Obama went to SWIFT and wanted them to be removed from, from the SWIFT system. And they said, we can't do that. You can't turn the world monetary system into politics. And they refused. So <clears throat> that was the right decision. Uh, you know, and so they replaced the, the head of the SWIFT in 2019. <laughs>And they just do whatever they're told. And the consequence of that is they've already divided the world economy. So China is now creating its chip system to compete. So there's no longer a global economy. Um, you know, you know, we have basically these politicians that don't understand what they're doing. And, you know, they they only think about the immediate time frame. That's it. So, I mean, over my career of some 40 years of dealing with governments from Europe, America, Asia, uh, what I could say is that <clears throat> never will they do anything, you know, for the future. If I say, gee, this, we don't do stop borrowing and never repaying, uh, this is going to come to a head in 20 years. Yeah, 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 they say, but, but I won't be there. So it's, it's not their problem. That'd be somebody else's. So that's our problem that we have in the West. Uh, no matter what country you go to, these politicians could care less about the future. All they're looking for is the headlines right now. And so, okay, Russia went into here, so we have to punish them. Do you realize what you're doing longer term? They don't even think about it. Uh, and being an international advisor, I mean, honestly, if I had to give uh, unbiased advice to somebody in China, I have to say, listen, look at what they did to Russia. Your assets are no longer safe because if they get into a into some sort of a uh, a, a fight or a spitting match with China. They can say, "Oh, will you support that that regime?" And you, ju they just confiscate your assets. That defeats the very basis of civilization and the global economy. Um, you know, putting sanctions on one country versus another is one thing. When you start going after individuals, then you know it's absurd. You know, Czechoslovakia is saying that they wanted to confiscate it the assets of all Russian people and to get them back, you had to prove you didn't support Putin. I mean, you know, what is this? This is not so. So then you're going to start, you know, then what's the next step? You know, in the United States, well, anybody that voted for the, the opposition that lost, we're going to confiscate their assets. I mean, you know, there's no rule of law in this. And, and that's the real problem. Mm -hmm. And on the, the Ukraine war specifically, uh, can you explain how you see the, the, it more as a climate war and the link to the World Economic Forum Great Reset? Uh, look, this is, is um, it, it, the climate change people are, in my opinion, just, you know, insane. Uh, they're trying to shut down fossil fuels everywhere without any alternative already in place, you know, and they just like, um, think, well, you know, don't worry about it. Somebody will figure out what, you know, afterwards, we just have to shut it down. And that's all they're doing. And <clears throat> Russia is the largest producer of energy in the world, actually. Uh, and <clears throat> Uh, Fifty percent of their GDP is all energy production. So um, to them, it's like we have to shut down Russia, and that's really the agenda here. Uh, I mean, if you look unbiased at the Munich 
uh, conference in February 20th, you had the vice president of US, Camilla, stand up and say, oh, you know, Ukraine should join NATO. Then the 23rd, you have Zelensky coming out. Yes, we're going to look at, at, you know, acquiring nuclear weapons, you know, and point them at Russia. Putin goes in the next day. Okay, now the Belgrade Agreement, most people probably don't know, but Ukraine had more nuclear weapons than China. And so the Belgrade Agreement was you, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, turned it back to Russia, uh, and NATO agreed they would not enter Ukraine. And Russia said, okay, fine, you remain neutral. We're not in, you know, we will stay out. So this was a complete, I think, provo provocation to start this war. I mean, um, I mean, all the propaganda that's out there, it's, oh, Russia, Russia, Russia. Adelaide University just came out and showed that they did an, an intense study and all this propaganda supporting Ukraine has been, you know, created by bots, which they have unleashed all right, uh, on Twitter, etc. So to try and create this image that they are, um, oh, fighting for democracy, it, it, that's a complete lie. Uh, the Minsk Agreement, which was brokered by Germany and France, said that the Donbass, which is is historically always been Russia, all right, and they're all Russians ethnically there. And so that they should be allowed to vote on their own independence. And everybody agreed to that, and that was the deal. And all of a sudden, Zelensky says, no, that's it, not it. Um, as soon as the 2014 revolution took place, the West installed an interim government, and they instantaneously began the civil war against the Donbass. Um, so uh, we have to look at this stuff, you know, objectively. I mean, this has been, uh, it's been intentionally created for this very purpose. And, you know, uh, I've just put out a book, The Seizure of Russia. And, <clears throat> I got a hold of all the declassified documents from the Clinton administration, and they basically, you know, confirm everything that you hear in the news is just all propaganda. You know that oh, Russia is uh, Putin is this madman, and that he is uh, trying to resurrect the USSR and all this nonsense. All right. Um, what people don't know what's been omitted from the history books and i was shocked when i found it myself uh when <clears throat> ussr you know collapsed in in 1991 nato invited russia to join uh and that is what sparked the coup against gorbachev i mean you can imagine the the old hardliners saw that as a surrender of russia to the united states all right, so naturally they were, you know, just as anti-American as we had neocons that were anti-Russian, you know, uh, these people can't live without hating somebody at night. Um, so they staged a coup when Gorbachev was uh, in Crimea on a vacation, they surrounded him and that was it. Yeltsin stood on the tanks uh, in Moscow and pleaded with the military not to fire on their own people. And they didn't. So then the coup collapsed. Uh, and then Yeltsin became um, the head of, of Russia. So the <clears throat> Yeltsin was actually under attack from both sides. You had the oligarchs led by uh, Barisnovsky, who tried to set him up and, and blackmailing him that he had to step down in 2000. Uh, or all, all his corruption was going to be exposed, stealing money from the IMF loans, etc. Um, and so what happened on the other side, the old line communists, they filed an impeachment motion to get rid of Yeltsin. 
So he was, you know, between both sides. And all the documents, I've got the phone call trans, you know, uh, transcripts from him to Clinton. And he turned to Putin and he says he will continue the democratic process. Uh, nobody knew him. He was not a communist. He was against the communists and he was, wasn't an oligarch. So that's why Putin was so popular there. He had like a 75% popularity rating back then. Because uh, they saw him more or less like a Trump. You know, he wasn't a communist and he wasn't an oligarch. And he was the only guy standing in the middle. Uh, and the, the propaganda, oh, he's ex-KGB. Yeah, he was a low-level guy, worked in the KGB. And as soon as the USSR failed, he quit in 91. <laughs> so... Uh, it was never like the head of the KGB or something like that. I mean, it, uh, and he's taken no action in 20 some years to try to expand the USSR. In fact, <clears throat> he's been the only leader of Russia who ever criticized uh, Lenin. He said, oh, he was just a Bolshevik. And he ruined the, the great empire of Russia, which was not USSR, but the empire of the czars. Um, so he's more nostalgic from that way. And uh, that's been his problem with Ukraine. Ukraine is where uh, the Rus or the Russians actually began. And so what happened was the Mongols invaded Europe and they destroyed Kiev. And so eventually the, the the Rus reappeared in Moscow. So Putin was not interested in invading all of Ukraine or taking Ukraine or anything of that nature. Uh, his critics in Russia um, are, were basically saying, see what's happened, you should have just wiped out Ukraine. Mm -hmm. To him, Kiev was like maybe London to America. Uh, the origin. <clears throat> so if you look at his communications from initially, he says, we are brothers, don't fight us, etc. He was there and to do exactly what he said, just to, to, uh, to protect the Donbass in the Civil War. And uh, that's really it. Now, when you're going to invade a country, military tactics are very straightforward like uh, the US and the West, what they did in Iraq. The first thing you do is you take down the power grid, then you take down the communications, then you go for the water supply. And he did none of that. All of a sudden he's been attacking the power grids because of the criticism from the uh, far right in Russia. And if he doesn't do that, my concern is that they would actually overthrow him, maybe by next April or May. Um, so again, you have all this propaganda from the West, making it sound like if you just remove Putin, you know, the world would be happy. And it, it, that's just complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you remove Putin and we're going to have people that are far worse right. on the other uh, side. Yeah. Uh, so you have to be understand what's going on. And, and most of the propaganda has been created by Ukraine. Um, even the IMF listed Ukraine as the most corrupt government uh, in Europe, if not the world. Um, Zelensky ran, you can Google it. You know, he was against corruption and uh, <clears throat> he was going to seek peace with Russia. He's done exactly the opposite. The Panama Papers came out and he's got hundreds of millions of dollars he's been stashing offshore. I mean, corruption is the name of the game in Ukraine. Uh, all the stuff from the Biden administration, his son hired over, it's all Ukraine. Uh, I mean, that's, that's it. And <clears throat> the real story that is not being told is just go ask its neighbors. In, in Montenegro, the people are, are supporting Russia, not Ukraine. 
uh, you have Poland, um, you know, those a couple of missiles he tried to say they were they were Russians. Now mm. you're starting to have you know politicians there saying we have to rethink what we're doing with Ukraine. Uh, Serbia is for you for Russia. Uh, everywhere around, they know the Ukrainians. They've dealt with them, and you know it. You know it's not a something where if you shake their hand, you got to count your fingers. You got to make sure you still have your arm. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, th yeah. they are notorious that way. I mean, it's even the the Russian and Italian mafia are afraid of the Armenian and Ukrainian mafia. Why? Because you mess with the Italian mafia. Okay, fine, they take you out. All right. <clears throat> Armenia and Ukraine, they take you, your family, your kids, and the dog. <laughs> they don't want any retribution from anybody when they grow up. Uh, it's it's quite different. Um, it's a different culture there, and, and the hatred goes back uh, unbelievable. Um, you know, and that's what created World War One. You had to serve, a, you know, kill a, a, an Austrian who they, they hated. Uh, you can Google and find out, you know, the Ukrainians killed over 300,000 uh, Polish uh, mm -hmm. in their, you know, ethnic cleansing. And Poland has come out that, you know, every country has apologized for their actions in World War II, Germany, Japan, not Ukraine. Uh, and Poland has come out and said Ukraine has never apologized for the massacres against the Polish people. They don't even respond. Um, you know, it, it, it's a culture that that is so misreported in, in the Western press. It's, it's, it's very sad. Uh, but mm -hmm. I mean, we have employees that were in Kiev and also Donetsk. It, they don't even want to talk to each other. I mean, you can't bring a bottle of Russian vodka to dinner in Kiev. It's an insult. <laughs> um, so it, it's, you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Now, in, from this initial Ukraine war, do you see the potential of it evolving into like maybe a Bretton Woods three uh, dividing the world into two, maybe, you know, Russia bringing in China and then there's two different financial and economic systems or? Yes, I mean, what you have here is China is not stupid. Um, if the West thinks that they can do what they did in, in Afghanistan and uh, use Ukrainians until the last one dies on the field, um, you know, to weaken Russia, and then they can just walk in and take it. Uh, that is, is a very distorted view. They had the same thing in the Middle East. Uh, this idea, they, they convinced themselves that, oh, the leader is a dictator, and therefore, if we remove him, we walk in and the people will cheer. That has never happened once. Uh, but they used that, that scenario for uh, Iraq. They used it for uh, Syria. I mean, you know, 11, I mean, Libya, the same thing. It's just not true. Uh, it's just not true. And then the same propaganda they put out, oh, if we just remove Putin, there are far worse people there in, in Russia than Putin. And, uh, and they're going to defend themselves. And honestly, China is going to back Russia. They have to because they know they're going to be next. Uh, you already see, you know, basically Iran coming out on Russia's side, North Korea is sending missiles over Japan. Uh, I don't know if these people are blind, but even Turkey may take the, the Russian side. Um, you know, it's the lies and propaganda from the West do not, you know, go very well outside. Uh, and they can tell us everything they want on TV. That's very nice. And, and keep the people, you know, stupid, uh, more or less like Pravda did in Russia. Uh, so it's, this is where we're at. Anybody talks against them, oh, that's cancel, cancel them. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's very bad.
In terms of time frame, is there a time frame that you think the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, would make a move like in the currency against the U.S. dollar, like some kind of commodity-based currency, do you see? Well, I don't think that that is uh, really much of a threat to the dollar. Uh, you, you have to understand that the support of the dollar is not that it's it's paper or anything else. It, it's the fact that the United States dollar is the only currency that's never been canceled. And there are no controls on it. So uh, like Japan, you can't issue a bond in Japanese yen without permission from the Ministry of Finance. So anybody can issue a, a dollar you know, loan or whatever, issue a bond, whatever. They don't have to go back to the United States to ask. Uh, Europe, Britain, they routinely cancel currencies. So 70% of the paper dollars actually circulate outside the United States because it's the only currency that people can trust. Even Canada uh, passed the law and they canceled all the high denomination currency. So it, it's a little bit more than than just what is behind gold. I mean, uh, for Europe or for the United States or or, or you backing things like that is uh, it's kind of ancient history. The real wealth of a nation that, that Adam Smith was talking about wasn't how much gold you had. It was the product, uh, the productivity of the people. I mean, if you look at, um, really, if you look at Germany, you look at Japan, you look at China, they rose from the ashes without gold. Uh, it's their people that is the wealth of a nation. Uh, and it's the product uh, that, the productivity that they can bring to, to the market, making things. I mean, you look at Germany, it rose from, you know, the ashes to be the number one economy in Europe. Um, so it, it wasn't based upon uh, gold or even natural resources, per se. Uh, <clears throat> they are dividing the, the world economy and what will I think crack the dollar probably off by around 2028 or so is the lack of confidence. Once the confidence in the United States collapses, that's it. Um, I've published on the site about the, we all know how Rome fell, okay? But we don't really necessarily know precisely how uh, or the fact that it only took eight years. Uh, the the persians captured uh the emperor valerian the first in 260 a.d and rome couldn't muster an army to go get him so i mean can you imagine if biden went to russia and said well we're going to lock him up that's it you come get him and you can't i mean then what happened in rome that undermined everything suddenly you you no longer saw your country as in you know invulnerable then the northern you know barbarians said hey the persians got away with it we should try it too so then they started invading um they built the, the big wall around rome in 270 a.d all right so if you look at their currency it, it collapsed from a silver you know denarius to virtually just bronze and it only took eight years um so <clears throat> bull markets are always longer drawn out things it takes people a long time to gain confidence etc but we all lose it very quickly mm -hmm. uh, so the bear market you know even if you look at the stock market crash in 29 okay the low is 1932. it's not like 20 years or 30 years it's it's very short sweet and to the point uh look at the crash in and the basically bitcoin same thing we're like down 90 percent real fast all right uh uh so it that's what we have to understand yes rome lasted a thousand years and it was not like a 747 coming in for a landing nice and gradual it it was like a waterfall it just you know collapsed and then that's the way the west will collapse very quickly um 
I think it was St. Jerome, Jerome said that uh, when Rome fell, they were still laughing because they were watching the, you know, the, the games in the Colosseum and said, oh, barbarians are here. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we're likely to see the same situation. Okay. And you mentioned equities. Um, do, do you see the potential like for the S&P 500 index to go nominally below 3,000 or, or could it happen more in real terms like against a basket of commodities or inflation? <clears throat> no, when even if you look at the German hyperinflation, uh, when that was such an incident of, of the collapse in confidence in government, First, in 1918, you had the, the revolution against the emperor. So that was the Weimar Republic. And they were socialists. They were actually inviting Russia to please come take them. They wanted to join this Marxist utopia. Um, so <clears throat> then they put on uh, draconian reparation payments, which they could not make. And in December 22, and I think this is very important to understand. You can buy the bonds on eBay. Uh, the government confiscated 10% of everybody's assets, period. And they handed you a bond, which they, of course, defaulted on. That is what sparked the hyperinflation, all right, that, which came in 23. All of a sudden, you lost the complete confidence in the government. Um, you didn't trust anything they said. Um, anything they did and that's when things get really dicey very fast all right so that's probably we're going to start seeing some of that next year um our computer showing at 2023 is a rise in civil unrest um these people don't understand what they have unleashed really um fine it cost me twice as much to fill my car you know i'm not starving however you go to a third world country and they can't feed their kids you know the plus energy prices being up they're in dollars and the dollar has risen so you that's why you're seeing you know political unrest in greece and and sri lanka all these different places uh, it, it's this inflation is really hurting a lot of people and <clears throat> the greens all cheer. I mean, you just look at Germany. I mean, they're quite, I, I think they're totally insane. I mean, not only do they want to shut down fossil fuels they they don't even want nuclear energy. Mm. How are people going to survive a winter if you don't have anything? Uh, I mean, you know, it, it just doesn't seem as though there's anybody with half a brain is even thinking about this. I mean, what happens if you start having a lot of elderly freeze to death because they have no heat? You know, I think you're looking at major civil unrest next year. And these Greens have, you know, only looked at what they want to accomplish and not the transition period to even get to that point. Um, and, and that's the real danger here. So uh, our computer search is showing massive civil unrest next year. I, I And I think that you're looking at probably international war after 2024. Um, and most of what we are dealing with is that these governments are, are basically broke. All right, the debt has has exploded because of COVID. They have never any intention of paying anything back. Uh, and I've been in meetings and I've said, you know, this isn't going to work. And they said, no, no, you're wrong. We're the government. We can do whatever we want. And the people will always buy our, our nonsense. And that's really been the, 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 the view. Yeah. Um, so when Klaus Schwab is out there saying you'll own nothing and be happy, he's actually making it sound like he's they're doing this for you. You're the one that has this debt burden. We're trying to help you. That's total nonsense. Um, it, it, it's kind of like the insurance companies and basically 
when they couldn't, you know, they sell you fire insurance, uh, accident insurance, all this, but they couldn't sell death insurance. So they just changed it and called it life insurance. And then everybody, oh yeah, yeah I want some life insurance. It's death insurance. All right. It, it was a great pl play, but when you, somebody said, gee, you want to buy some death insurance? They thought it was bad luck. I'm not ready to die yet. I don't want to buy it. That I might die, you know? And so they just called it life and everybody brags about how much they got. <laughs> um, and, and that's what Schwab has done, you know, by making it sound, oh, you'll own nothing and be happy. And people are going, oh, you know, he's trying to do this with communism. This is basically uh, the propaganda because government is defaulting. And if they default, there goes everybody's pensions. You know, it's all gone. All right. So they need war and they really think that by creating war they can get to brenton woods too all right and then redesign the currency they want it to be digital uh because in in honestly in 40 years that i've dealt with governments they are never the problem we are and um they just simply view that if we we all cheat this is it and if we all paid 100% of the taxes that they think we owe, uh, they wouldn't have a problem. And I said, this is ridiculous, because whatever the taxes you collect, you always spend more anyhow. But to them, you find a $100 bill in a parking lot, and they go, well, you cheated us, where's our 50%? You know? um, this is just the attitude. And it's why I've said that uh, republics are the worst form of government possible because they can easily be bribed and there there's no long term and they don't only look at, at their self-interest not ours mm -hmm. so uh there's nobody coming here on a white horse to, to save the day um regardless of their political party or whatever it, it, this is just reality mm -hmm. and in terms of the sovereign debt crisis happening um you mentioned there would likely be a, a flight to dow equities even, even since the beginning of this year i think the uh, dow has outperformed the nasdaq and the s p yes. but it, it, in terms of what you see on the international capital flows is that flight to dow equities happening or will it accelerate into next year uh, yes i mean we'll, we'll go back uh and retest support after november but um you know, you have to understand how international capital is different than domestic. All right. <clears throat> the Dow has outperformed uh, the NASDAQ because it's international capital flows. Like when the Japanese were big on buying real estate, they buy the trophies. They bought Rockefeller Center. You know, they don't go down the street and start buying uh, $200,000 houses from mamas and pops. Um, you know, they want the, the big showcase ones. And, and that's where capital, you know, major international capital comes in. They look at the Dow. Okay, they're the safest. We know they're not going to go buy stock in FTX or something like that. Um, they're just not going to do that. And, you know, it, it's um, <clears throat> also you have to understand the, the way institutions function. Uh, you know, we get called in because we have a 40 year track record. You can have the best track record for six months, walk in and nobody's going to touch it because <clears throat> if they recommended it and then you blow up like FTX, they lose their job. So they want safety. Uh, you know, they want something that's been around for a long time and that everybody else is using. Hey, we we're all doing it. Oh, OK, fine. But, you know, you stick your neck out and buy something like FTX, you lose your job because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, on interest rates, uh, you mentioned recently about uh, the Fed funds rate for the U.S. Central Bank Federal Reserve running into resistance at 4.75% and the highest top potential is 6.25%. Do you still see that? And, and could that also affect the the U.S. dollar, you know, may, maybe uh, strengthening uh, at a peak at some point. Yes, I mean, I think you <clears throat> you have to understand the central banks um, have lost all their power. 
you know, the only thing they have is, is interest rates. That's it. So, but this kind of inflation is shortages. And Lagarde actually just came out and, and confirmed what I've been saying, um, that even a mild recession is not going to stop this kind of inflation. Um, she's not going into it as detailed as, as I've been saying, but basically she's just confirming, yeah, okay, fine, what he's saying is right. You, you know, raising interest rates does not make it rain, <laughs> all right? Um, <clears throat> That's for speculative booms. It's not, you know, when we're dealing with shortages, it's 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 something completely different. And and what we have here is, uh, you know, the 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 brain dead decisions of locking dust down and stuff like that. These politicians, again, they only look at what, oh, that's you know, everybody's doing it, so I should do it. They don't ask what are the ramifications of this. You know, you stop truckers from from delivering food. You, you know, I got emails from farmers. They had to, you know, kill 30,000 chickens because they couldn't get feed for them and they couldn't get them to the market. Um, you know, and then they go, oh, gee, there's a shortage. How'd that happen? You know, and then they want to blame it on Putin. You know, um, it, it's just absurd. But so. You know, I was actually surprised that Lagarde actually came out and said, well, even a modest recession is not going to reduce this type of inflation. Um, she's at least recognized that we're dealing with shortages and not a speculative boom. So uh, the Fed problem is, is that if they don't raise your interest rates, they get blamed for the inflation. Because um, the politicians want to spend whatever they can, and then they go, Hey, inflation, that's the Fed's job, not our job. So um, you, if they didn't raise in, in interest rates, the politicians will be screaming to replace, you know, the chairman of the Fed and they should all be fired or whatever. Um, so raising interest rates blows everything out and it's created a huge problem. Uh, and that is the, the <clears throat> we've been issuing debt at like 0 0.25 the negative rate since basically 2014. The vast majority of bonds out there are, are down. You raise interest rates to 3% and they are devastated. That was the financial crisis in the in, in London that the institutions, the life insurance, they can't afford to buy the long term anymore. If you're in a position where short term rates are going to continue higher, why would you buy any long term debt? It's going to be immediately worth less as the day after you bought, bought it. Then you had uh, Janet Yellen coming out and a lot of people didn't understand what she was really saying. But uh, the Fed creates money, the Treasury cannot. But what she was saying was that she would buy in the long term and swap it with the short term. Why? Because these institutions can't handle the long term anymore. But secondly, we've reached the capacity of primary dealers. Uh, and the Treasury doesn't sell its debt directly. It it sells it. You have to get it, you know, to a primary dealer, and to get one of those licenses, you have to guarantee to buy X amount of bonds. So if they then issue all these long term bonds, they're forced to buy them, but they can't sell them. Guess what? The primary dealers go bust. So the whole system come collapses. That's what Yellen was saying. Um, without saying it as bluntly as I was, uh, have been saying, but, you know, we've reached the capacity of all this debt from primary dealers. They're no longer big enough to, to continue to buy this much debt. So it's all just, you know, impacting everything. And so rates will go higher because there's no bid on, on the long end. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they will have to raise rates just to try and attract somebody to buy this stuff. Um, but meanwhile, they're shortening the maturity. And on oil, um, 
where do you see the Saudi Arabia US relationship and the, the whole petrodollar system which sort of factors into the bond market as well right the whole um well um <clears throat> You know, I don't see that as being a longer term a, a viable um, issue. I mean, Saudi Arabia has already agreed to start selling oil in rubles, etc. Um, I mean, there is no real petrodollar. I mean, that was something that they people created as a myth in the 70s. But mm. as I said, the, the value of the dollar is the productivity of the United States and that productivity uh, has created the largest consumer market in the world. So China needed American consumers to sell something to. Germany, the same thing. Uh, the German economic model was just to make stuff to sell to other people, not to themselves. So they didn't really expand their domestic consumer market. They were always looking to sell to somebody else. That was the whole purpose of the euro. So they could sell their, you know, their products to everybody else in Europe without currency risk. Um, so uh, that's really, you know, longer term. I think that uh, the Middle East is is realizing that they have a problem, and you, then you have on top of that this battle with Russia, which is is going to be. You're looking at Syria, you know. Um, Iran clearly on the Russian side, Libya will probably go that direction, maybe even Turkey. And so you're looking at dividing the Middle East as well. Um, and <clears throat> you had UAE coming out and saying they want firm commitments from the United States, uh, Saudi Arabia warning that Iran, you know, is eyeing them up to attack. And they've just this whole nonsense with Ukraine has divided the entire world. Totally unnecessary. Uh, they should have forced Zelensky to simply honor the Minsk agreement, allowed the Donbass to go. I mean, Henry Kissinger said the same thing. Um, Henry came out and even said that every president uh, has always invited him to the White House, but not Biden. Mm. So, I mean, they, they want war. This is simply it. Uh, the, it's climate change. They have to destroy Russia because 50% of it is all climate. You know, they're insane. They're completely insane. And, and they don't look at this at, at all. Or, and they don't care about the dead bodies on the battlefield. They really don't. Okay, incredible. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, final question. Um, is there like a country or a jurisdiction that is best to, to move to, get, given all these, uh, you know, the chaos and just, you know, from a safety perspective or uh, preservation of freedoms and liberties? Is it like Florida, Costa Rica, Uruguay, mm -hmm. any ideas? Well, I think the, the southern United States will be OK, because I think we're you're looking at the United States probably splitting up as well. Uh, but. You know, they rigged the election in Brazil. To, you know, to, they had to get rid of Bolsonaro. Uh, I can tell you uh, absolutely a fact. He was there at uh, Davos in 2019, and they were trying to push him on this climate change. And he turned around and said, you people are all a bunch of crazy. You know, you're all cr crazy. So he had to be removed. Uh, mm -hmm. They had to remove Trump. Uh, they have to remove Putin and they have to remove Jing. And this is what their agenda really is. It's it's this climate. I think in history, you're going to look back at this and they're going to call it the climate change war. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And great. That's a, a really great insight and discussion. Martin, how, how can our listeners learn more about your work and where can they find more information? Uh, I would say go just go to our website. It's armstrongeconomics.com. Uh, we respect everybody's privacy, so you don't have to uh, sign in, and we don't sell advertising, so you don't have to keep clicking all these things to get off your. So you're going to read whatever's there. Um, it's a public service. That's what we provide, uh, and just hoping to educate you know as many people as possible. 
Great. Thank, thank you so much, Martin. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me.